stage. Okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm really excited to be here at Rev. Is everyone having a great time? Yeah, that's an enthusiastic response from a data science crowd. Uh, my name is Lisa Green, and I work, at so I work on social impact and public policy at Domino Data Lab. And I'm very excited for this panel on data responsibility. My guests are on the screen. You can see this is Natalie Evans-Harris, COO of BrightHive, Hello. Chad Wilsey of the Audubon Society, and Margie Zwemer, who's at BlackRock. Uh, why don't you guys start by giving a little bit of background of who you are, the kind of work you do, anything to help the crowd get to know you. Uh, so I'm Natalie Evans-Harris. I do all the things data. Uh, so I'm co-founder and CEO of a data technology company called BrightHive, where we focus on building out the data technology infrastructure for state local governments and other social sector organizations to be able to use data effectively. Before joining BrightHive, I served under the Obama administration in the Office of Science and Technology Policy as a senior data, as a senior policy advisor to the U.S. Chief Data Officer and to the U.S. Chief Data Scientist and to the U.S. Chief Technology Officer. Claim to fame was starting a federal data science community of practice from zero to about 200 federal data leaders across 40 agencies. Uh, and then in addition to that, I worked 16 years in the federal government, um, various data leadership roles in national security agency and across the intelligence community. And then between Obama administration and Bright Hive, I also launched a community-driven principles for ethical data sharing initiative. That's me, and I'm a mom. <laughs> <laughs> Chad? Hi, I'm Chad Wilsey. I'm the uh, Vice President for Conservation Science for the National Audubon Society. Uh, we're a over 100-year-old nonprofit conservation organization focusing on conserving birds in North America. Uh, in the science uh, division and in our conservation science group, we use data science to run analyses that think about uh, how birds might be impacted by uh, our decisions about land management, about climate change, um, and we try to do analyses that will inform our conservation and advocacy work. So we're trying to uh, use data science to uh, promote good and, and conservation in, in the environmental field. All right, and uh, I'm Margit. I'm currently at BlackRock with the Systematic Active Equities Group. I've had a career that tends to pendulum back and forth between finance and tech. So I started out as a high-frequency trader. I came to the Valley and was an early employee at Kaggle, the open data competition startup, as well as having my own startup for several years. And now I'm back on the finance side of things, mainly focused on uh, emerging markets and turning data into investment outcomes for our clients. Excellent. See, what a great panel I picked for you guys. <laughs> um, so the title of our, our panel is Data Responsibility. Let's start off with, like, how do each of you define data responsibility? Natalie, I know you, this is a primary focus of your work. Why don't you start us off? Uh, so when I think about data responsibility, I think about it um, really in the form of not just what can we do with data, but what should we do with data? And how do we make sure that as we use data and apply it in specific technologies, innovations, generating reports, communicating information, how do we do so in a way where we're thoughtful about how the information is received, interpreted, how we're protecting information, and how much confidence we have in the data that's being used to answer those questions. So that's really, for me, data responsibility and a lot of the work that I do is centered around how do we build the capacity to really think about not just the intended, um, not just the intended solutions, but also those unintended consequences and being able to address those as well. For us at uh, Audubon, data responsibility is about um, trying to build a transparent conservation organization. We are striving to use data to inform the work we do to conserve birds and to protect the environment. And we want to do that in a transparent way. One of the key elements of that is doing analyses and publishing them in peer-reviewed uh, literature and having those be reviewed by other scientists and acknowledged as being uh, appropriately uh, constructed and uh, conducted in terms of the analyses that we're doing and the conclusions that we're drawing from our analyses. So right now, actually, we're, we're kind of expanding our use of data science to uh, integrate throughout the organization and trying to, again, make the organization more transparent by showing 
uh, our work, uh, the analyses that we're running, and the impact that we're having in a very transparent way. So that's, that's our goal. All right, then I kind of see this through the two lenses of the different sides my career has had. When I'm in finance, I've got a very clear set of duties and responsibilities that I'm in a fiduciary role, there's a highest standard of care that I owe my clients. So if someone gives me money or asks me for investment advice, there's very clear things I can and cannot do with data. I can't get material non-public information on companies. I have to validate my models, and if I'm not checking that and monitoring them, you know, you're going to get a visit from the SEC. <laughs> When I'm on the tech side, none of that guidance is there. It's, you have your individual, you know, how you're looking at the model, how you want to present your work to the world, but there isn't that set of guidelines that if someone gives me their data, am I a fiduciary of that data? What are the duties and standard of care I owe someone who has entrusted me with their data? That's a really interesting point about compliance, ver money versus data. Now that I've heard you talk about, sometimes when you talk about data responsibility, you break it into kind of three buckets, and compliance is one of them. Can you yeah. share those buckets? Sure. So when I've, if you've seen me speak, or some of the things that I talk about, and I've spoken to Lisa about lots, is that when you think about data responsibility, you're really talking, and data ethics, you're really talking about three areas, one being compliance, which is kind of, you know, your GDPRs, your, your privacy laws, and making sure that you're doing what you're legally responsible to do. Oftentimes what we'll see is that, that that compliance arm is treated as a ceiling, and really it should be treated as a floor. It's really just the start for what data responsibility is and used as a framework and a guide to just entering into the space of data responsibility. There's also this piece around culture and, and how do you make sure that you're operating and, and working in an organization that encourages these conversations around ethical dilemmas and thinks about data responsibility and ethics throughout the entire development life cycle? So not just after the product is developed and during testing, but as you're collecting data, as you're transforming that data, as you're, anal as you're analyzing the data, what are some questions you could ask yourself around making sure that you're using this data responsibly and also the deprecation, the retirement of that data. So what does that organizational environment look like and how do you increase opportunities for addressing those ethical dilemmas beyond um, whistleblowing, quitting, or being silent? <laughs> how do we increase opportunities to actually identify and then make changes in products because of those ethical dilemmas that have been identified? And then the third one is the social responsibility. I'll often say that ethics and whether you're being responsible is not guided by something tangible. Compliance measures it. Compliance gives you something to measure it, but you're not really ethical and trustworthy unless the public says you are. So how do you, do, how do you handle that social responsibility so that you're being transparent in the things that you do and you communicate in a way that the, that, that the public and that your customers trust and believe that what you are doing is being done in a responsible and ethical way? So it's kind of the three, the three areas, compliance, the three legs. culture, and social responsibility. Mm -hmm. And it does sound, Chad, when you talk about transparency, that does sound like social responsibility. And it also sounds a bit to me like culture. You know, how is the culture within, I know you have an ivory tower background, you know, and now you're doing research in, at Audubon. How is that culture or that social responsibility different than, say, where Margit is or in the federal government? Yeah, I think uh, in our context, again, I mentioned how we're trying to use data science to make our work more transparent. We're a conservation organization. We try to do things on the ground that are protecting birds. We're maybe protecting lands. We're managing lands. We're trying to influence the federal government and where they're making, taking action uh, in, in allowing development or not allowing development, wind energy, energy uh, natural resource extraction. All of those contexts. Uh, have potential to impact the environment. And what we're trying to do in the organization right now is to move towards this culture of transparency and demonstrating the impact we're having using data science or an analysis of our impact. And so that's a real culture shift within the organization. It involves recognizing the fact that sometimes 
we might have been doing something for many years that hasn't had an impact and that we can't demonstrate the impact of our work uh, using data analysis, looking at the data that we have. Or maybe we don't have enough data and just need to collect more information on how the birds are responding or how the habitats are responding to these environmental changes. So there's been a real, it's been a process. I would say we're in the middle of the process. Our data science team, which what we call our science division, has been expanding and becoming more integrated throughout the nonprofit. And, uh, and it's a lot of conversations when you're working with uh, stakeholders or practitioners thinking about the work that they're doing, the conservation work they're doing on the ground, trying to explain to them how we can assess the effectiveness of that work, doing the analyses and then sharing those results and then having a conversation about what that means and what the implications are. So it's, it's very much a cultural shift within our organization. It's an exciting shift for me to feel like the tools that I have as a data scientist and from an academic background have the potential to influence the organization and increase our transparency and, and it ultimately lead to us being more effective. Uh, and so that's really been the exciting part about it. Um, and it's, uh, it, yeah, it has recalled, required a culture shift. And then what was the last category? I was going to say something about that. I forgot. Well, it's social, the, responsibility, social responsibility, but that's also part of, I think this one really touches on both those buckets, right? It mm -hmm. takes a culture shift to get there, but it is part of the social responsibility to, to be that way, right? Yeah, and as an organization, we're all committed to the environment and protecting birds and, and our natural resources, but it takes another step to say that, okay, and I'm also going to maybe change my behavior if I get some new information that suggests that what I have been doing isn't actually as effective as I thought it was. And so that's, that's a social responsibility. Yeah. And it makes us excited, those of us who are doing the data science, excited about the work we're doing because we feel like it has an integral impact on the organization. Mm -hmm. So, Margie, you have a, a very different perception of, um, from finance. The goal is not to protect the environment. The goal is to make <laughs> money, right? You know, so, how do those three things, compliance, that makes absolute sense, um, culture and social responsibility, how are those in the world of finance or tech? Feel free to answer with either hat. Yeah, I mean, in the company I work in now, clearly we have you know entire division devoted to compliance, yet if you look at the track record of the financial industry, just because you have those rules in place <laughs> doesn't mean people are going to act ethic ethically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there's some very interesting parallels between what's happening in, happening in tech in the data privacy regulation space that if you look at the things I have to comply with for finance, a lot of those date to not too long after 1929 or not too long after 2008. And there is some feeling that tech might be starting to approach that same sort of inflection point where it's just been wild west, wild west, wild west. And then the regulatory apparatus starts to catch up, starts to realize that, hey, this isn't just you know a small group of people shoving decimals around. It impacts everyone. It impacts entire economies. On the culture side, I think what's interesting is that one of the biggest differences between uh, my current stint in finance and the last time I was there, about five years ago, is this shift towards the idea of ESG investing, so that's environmental social governance. And it's the idea that if before you were just saying to a client, I will deliver this level of returns at this level of risk, now they're asking you to say, I will deliver this level of returns at this level of risk and with this measurable amount of social impact, whether that's carbon cost, whether that's supporting companies who have good governance or other factors that we want to encourage. And so that's required finance to start collecting a whole new type of data. So, you know, we're looking at supply chains now. We're looking at who you hire and what you pay them and is there bias in that? So while I'm definitely not going to claim that, you know, I'm a saint, I get paid well for what I do, I do think there's an interesting aspect of the market almost forcing companies to be more transparent, saying, if you want us to be one of your stakeholders, we need to know more about you and what impact you're having and what data you're releasing. I'm, I'm really looking forward to talking about motivations, like you, Chad, some of the things you said about why to do this culture and you, Marie, but let's go back a second to compliance. You said, you know, the Wild West and maybe something's coming, like the inflections of these crashes, but Margie, we have GDPR now. Isn't everything okay? <laughs> it's all so, good, right? Natalie, isn't that Yeah, I was going to say good. that. Like, all we needed was Don't we all feel safe for us? Yeah. <laughs> this is where I wear the obligatory, I am not a lawyer, I am not an <laughs> EU legal expert hat, but I think the point you made earlier that compliance is a floor. For those who have had to deal with GDPR or just seen your inbox flooded with all the updated terms and conditions, it does, you know, 
make some important steps forward on saying, as an individual, what rights do I have in respect to my data? And it places a few obligations on companies that you need to have a data privacy officer, you should be taking security seriously, which you should have been doing anyway. But there's very little on that personal level of, as an investor, every year I'm sitting through slideshows on anti-money laundering. I'm sitting through slideshows on you know, duties to report if I see something going wrong, if I see a client's best interest not being held to the fore. There's none of that for, as a data scientist, what duties do I have towards the person I'm dealing with my data? And so asking every data scientist to be a philosopher, an ethics expert, an infosec expert is still putting a lot of the burden on people who shouldn't necessarily have to be showing leadership in that space just to do their job because those cultures aren't yet in place in companies where it's just, you know, it's this or nothing. Yeah, and you bring up a really good point around the need, because we're getting to this point in technology, where we're having to really balance the need to protect individuals with the need for company profits. I mean, that's a real thing. Right now, security and privacy and ethics and responsibility is really centered around how do I protect <laughs> my company and myself and what is the risk involved. So it's a very legal conversation. So to take, the, to take the, the other pieces of GDPR and some of these other bills that are coming out and really think about what the cultural responsibilities and the organizational responsibilities are can be very expensive, one. But two, it also highlights as a culture that you can't just have a group of technologists making decisions around technology. So do we now have to hire ethicists in all of our companies or do we require a data scientist to be ethicists? Like, where does it actually fit in the spectrum of product development? Um, Natalie, you mentioned it's expensive. I'd love to hear all three of your thoughts on what are the motivations for increasing data responsibility, whether it's data ethics or doing data for good, being more transparent. Uh, you can answer on a, the perspective of an individual, a team, a company. What, what are the motivations for why should people be What working? should be the motivations or what or are the motivations? Either. Let's, do, let's do both of those. <laughs> let's say the motivations right now are mostly legal and regulatory. And what do I have to do or not do in order to not get fined or jailed or have a public scandal? Um, what should it be is how do I do no harm? And how do I build trust in, in the public and, and make sure that I'm developing and delivering a quality solution to a problem? That's what it should be. But I don't know what that looks like, though. Well, it looks different for everybody. It looks different for everybody. And Chad, you have, well, like, there, was, there was not about getting fined. You're not moving to being more transparent. What were the motivations there? How did you convince the business side that this is, was worth it? Yeah, I would say that it's a response to a competitive environment among nonprofits. So we compete with each other in terms of getting foundation dollars, uh, federal funding, uh, monies that come in to support our work, uh, even the interest of the public in supporting through their own private donations to our organization. And so this idea of uh, being data driven and being transparent is a way to set ourselves apart from, from other nonprofit organizations and to, as I mentioned earlier, just show that we're actually having a quantitative impact. And if we can demonstrate that, then we're going to be, we're going to gain more interest from, from uh, foundations and funders of our work. Mary, that sounds a lot like your motivations with a slightly different frame, right? So there's the, the people want to have the social impact investing. But there are other things going on at BlackRock, right, that it's not just driven by that? Are there other reasons for being uh, responsible with your data at BlackRock? Maybe just showing that there's never going to be a public <laughs> scandal, like there have been with some other companies, that you guys are responsible. Does that help your branding? or? So I'll say getting, not being visited <laughs> by the SEC is always going to help your branding. <laughs> It's definitely a case where, one, because my current industry is regulated, this sort of compliance is non-optional. So it's just a cost of doing business. And because you know all your competitors are supposed to be doing this as well, it's not considered the, oh, we're putting ourselves at a disadvantage by not cutting it close to the edge. Right. The other level comes down to, we've talked a lot about risk. So if you're not protecting your data, you're at risk of being hacked or having a data breach. But there's also a risk in the sense that I think about it as a financial person, which is, you know, Am I being responsible with my client's money? Am I, given all the knowledge I have, am I investing it in the smartest way and giving them the most protection against the downside? 
So there's that demand of, I can't deliver the product that I said I'm going to deliver if I'm not taking that sort of model validation and data ethics into account. And the last side of it is that, you know, the reason this sort of green investing has become a bigger thing is because clients are asking for it. That not to offload the responsibility onto the customers again, but when people start saying, if you're going to invest you know, our money for us, you have to be able to deliver this sort of actionable measures of what its impact is. Yeah. That makes everyone's ears in the business perk up from compliance to the quants to the people in the C-suite. So yeah. there's a lot of power if you're the one with the money. So Natalie, doesn't that sound hopeful toward what it should be? You know, if it's people want to invest or want to donate to nonprofits that are having the most social impact, if people want to invest in companies that have things like gender parity or a low carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it sound hopeful that we're moving toward what it should be? I, absolutely, I think so. I, uh, I have two sides of my brain that always struggle with this stuff and there's this naivety that believes that people want to do good and all people want to do what's right. And so seeing that people are actually starting to ask those questions and, and say, well, what is the socially responsible thing to do? How, is, is what I'm doing going to be good for the world or is it going to be bad for the world? And actually having thoughts around it is definitely a positive thing. I'm really excited to see um, just like regular people, not like people in this room, but like my mom and dad um, asking questions around, well, what are you doing with my data? And, and that's driving business, because if they don't trust what you are doing, then they are not going to purchase your products. So that transparency around what you're doing as your business and what you're doing with people's data becomes that much more important because people are starting to ask those questions. You see what's happening with the 2020 census now. People are starting to boycott the census because they're like, we don't like that question, and we don't think your intentions are, for, or, are, are transparent and honest in what you're going to do with that data, so we won't participate. I love that. I love that like people are driving the motivations of companies because I also believe we're a capitalist society and money is the motivation for most capitalist companies. And that's not a bad thing, but it needs to be balanced. And, and we're starting to see that balance a little bit more. So I heard you both talk about, Margie and Chad, talk about measure and uh, Chad saying that you can want to show the impact that you're having, and Margie, you as well were saying, we have to deliver, <clears throat> this is the investment, this is the return, and this is the impact. What tools do you have for measuring these things, for showing how transparent you are, or auditing, or you know, what tools are available to measure and or increase social responsibility with data? <laughs> I, mean, I might even take that question a step back, that sometimes the modeling's not the issue, it's just purely the data especially because I work in emerging markets, there are companies that don't know what their own supply chain two or three levels down are doing. So if I'm trying to track that as well from the outside, I start, I end up talking to vendors that range from nonprofits who are collecting this data to name and shame companies to, you know, tools which I'm pretty sure were sort of funded out of Virginia. <laughs> so it's, you almost become a bit of a detective as a data scientist of if you're trying to build a model to predict or optimize for something, you have to be able to measure that. Mm -hmm. And until that data is there to be measured, you can't even start on the modeling task. We, uh, we work within, so I have an academic background, and we work within the, sort of the framework of, of academic research. And so if something passes through peer review publication, then it has met a certain standard in terms of uh, a metric to show impact. And so that's, that's what we've been using. Um, and it feels like, although you know, peer review is some, can have its imperfections, it's, a, it's certainly a well-accepted global standard, and, and that's what we've been using uh, to date to try to to demonstrate that uh, the work we're doing and the, the metrics that we're devising to show that impact are uh, reliable. What about uh, when you talk about transparency, Chad, is there a measure for transparency that we're getting more transparent? Is it very qualitative or? Uh, I think just showing <laughs> the numbers about, so birds are responding positively to our actions. I mean, there's not a lot of groups that, that are doing that, no, nonprofit groups that are actually doing that. It's, it's more 
uh, you know, in the past it's been more about uh, anecdotes and telling stories about uh, how things have been improved and just going a step beyond uh, an anecdote to something that's driven by numbers, I think, uh, mm -hmm. increases the transparency and allows someone seeing the numbers themselves to make a judgment statement about whether that uh, impact is real right. or perceived. So those are some measurement tools, but how about, now? could you speak to tools for increasing data responsibility within, like, as an individual, as a team, as a company, like your work on community-produced ethical data principles? Community-driven principles for ethical data sharing. <laughs> Mouthful. Um, so I think that there are ways, I would, I'll, I'll answer it two ways. I think that there are opportunities to upfront, think about what impact you wanna have and then define your success in that way. So like Bright Hive, we do, and it's not new and innovative, we do quarterly KPIs, where we go through this process as a company, and we define as individuals, what do we want to accomplish for that quarter, and that accomplishment has to be tied to one of our social impact objectives for the company and the way that we're building the product and what product we're de developing and how we do that. So we do KPIs as a company, and then we make those transparent, so it's not just for us, but it's shareable to any of our customers as well, like this is what we're doing and why we're doing it and what we're trying to focus on. Two, um, I have a real, like the thing that I'm really focused on right now is how do we build our individual capacity as um, data scientists, data practitioners, to go into whatever we are doing with ethics in our minds. So how do you workshop, how do you create your own individual codes of ethics? So the reason why we took this approach of doing a community-driven code of ethics is because we wanted to find out from data practitioners what were the things keeping you up at night? Like what were you worried about every time you use data and develop solutions? And then we did literature reviews and we, and we did research and we did a survey of about 2,000 data scientists who called themselves data scientists. I did not check them to see if they were actually were. But if you called yourself a data scientist, you participated in this survey that basically answered the questions of what kept you up at night. And then we broke that out into seven different areas, working groups around it. I had about a little bit over 100 data science volunteers over the span of about five months come together and define a set of principles. And then we came together and voted on those principles and created this code of ethics. And if you look at it, there's nothing groundbreaking in these principles, but what they have done is they've served as a, as a launching pad for people to be able to create their own individual ethos and approaches for the way that they build products. I've seen um, like Code for America, um, and other brigades that's a part of it and other communities like that have used it to create their own codes of ethics for how they as organizations are approaching data problems and challenges. And we as Bright Hive have used it to define our own ethos as a company and saying this is how we approach our interactions with our customers and make sure that they're not only getting a technology solution that benefits them, but they understand the power that they now have with this data and know how to use it responsibly. McGee, is, do you think that they, oh, I'm so sorry, Chad. Did you want to comment? I was going to comment. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, uh, I hadn't been familiar with this code of ethics until preparing for this panel, but uh, one of the things that we have done within our, uh, within our conservation science group, which is a group of academically trained data scientists who come from an ecology background but have been doing statistics and quantitative analyses throughout their lives before coming to Audubon, is Yes, we talk about our goal of having this peer-reviewed uh, measures of, of impact, and that's kind of first. But then beyond that, we have a set of core values, which actually overlay, uh, overlapped a lot with this code of ethics um, that Natalie was involved with. And um, some of the things that we really focus on are, yeah, we have these quantitative tools, but what's really important is when you're going through your modeling process is to go out and speak with people throughout the organization, our stakeholders, the people who are gonna use the information and listen. Listen to how they are thinking about the data that you're using. Listen to uh, the questions that they're interested in. And to do that in a way that's humble. Yes, we have these quantitative tools that are very powerful, but we can often learn something from the person who's gonna use the information that informs the modeling process and improves the, the end product because we took the time to listen and didn't come at things with more of an arrogant uh, mindset. And so um, 
So uh, those, those types of values, I think, are really important and, and ultimately lead to better analysis products that are more useful and, uh, and have a higher standard in terms of ethics. Totally agree, more useful. I think that's one of the motivations, is actually practicing data responsibility leads to a better product. Absolutely. I'm glad that you made that point, Chad. Maggie, can you, you talked about sitting through the slideshows and the compliance and all this thing. Can you imagine a financial institution ever making people sit through the data ethics principles? And if not, what do we need to do to get there? I mean, I can definitely see an era where if you're a tech company over a certain size, you have those same training and reportability requirements. But I think also looking at the history of the, history of the financial industry. It's going to take a crash to make it happen. <laughs> it, it's going to take multiple crashes, and it's going to take a lot of falling down and getting back up. It's not a case where, oh, now we're all enlightened, we've initiated a code of conduct. That's just the place to start. And unless people actively stick to that, then you're going to have all those scandals, all those you know, things that five years ago people wouldn't have even known could happen because that product didn't exist. Right. That could be a collateralized debt obligation or that could be an in-home speaker. But we're creating new problems as fast as we're solving them, it feels like sometimes. Yes. But so this is a question for all of you. How do we get to there? The, you say at some point there will be this compliance for tech companies over a certain size. In between, what can individuals do? What can teams do? Can, how can companies start to bring these? Is it a normative change, like do no harm? Is the Hippocratic Oath? Is it regulatory changes, like the way the finance? How do, how do we get to this place where everyone has to follow ethical data practices? I think it's, I think it's happening in some areas. I think it's going to be, uh, <clears throat> I think it's definitely compliance. You're going to see more policies and regs coming out. It's going to be great. GDPR for the US, yay. Um, and then I think you're going to start to see, in my, in the, back, the words that keep coming in the back of my head is, you know, data ethics is cool. So it's going to be one of those things where companies are going to, um, uh, so I think about Lyft and the company Lyft, how they changed their mantra to be, it matters how you get there. And that was in direct response to everything that was happening with Uber. No judgments. Um, but but I, think it, I, I think we're gonna get to this place where it's gonna be the cool thing to be responsible and ethical with the way that you use people's information. One of the things that I haven't said that I typically say is that the difference between people's digital lives and people's real lives is a non-existent line. It's, it's the same, it's one and the same, and people are finally starting to recognize that your data is you, and you are your data. So as companies realize that and treat data as they would treat their customers, you'll start to see more companies be very vocal, I hope. In, in the way that they do business, in the way that they communicate about their business, and that they are being ethical and practical and responsible in the way that they treat people mm -hmm. is the way that they treat data. Um, academically, we're starting to see more and more curriculums that incorporate ethics into the classes. So not like ethics over here as this elective that you have to take, <laughs> but actually as you learn to build databases, you're also learning about the ethical implications of, putting, of storing data in certain ways and making that data accessible in certain ways. I think once we, once we get all three of those to a really good state, um, then we may actually have a definition for what data science is and then we can move to that next level. <laughs> uh, we don't work so much with, uh, with people data, uh, and, and pri there's not as much privacy issues because we're talking about birds and bird <laughs> conservation. Yeah. Birds little, matter too. It's a little different context. <laughs> However, I do feel like it's still a relevant uh, question because I think in any organization there's a natural tension between the people who are working with the data and the people who want to talk about the results and, and make bold statements and be, you know, be leaders and thought you know, uh, have an impact, uh, a society impact. And so there's that uh, tension between what can we say with the data or what might we say or what sounds good. And so there's, that, there's always that conversation about, you know, what is, a, what is a real and authentic conclusion to draw from an analysis. And I feel like that is, um, 
you know, that's an ethical dilemma and something that we are constantly thinking about, and it's through conversation and familiarity and building relationships within an organization between people who work with data and people who communicate and, uh, and are uh, speaking with the public and shouting uh, you know, our messages from the rooftops. And just, just uh, that conversation, that relationship, that trust, uh, working with each other more closely, more integration essentially organizationally is, I feel like, a really important way to uh, get to a higher ethics where you know, people are able to freely share what their priorities are and you know, how far a data science, how far I'm comfortable going with this analysis or this conclusion uh, versus you know, you know, what we want to communicate more broadly. And so just through that uh, stronger integration and more communication and trust within an organization, I think, is a, is a helpful way to move towards uh, ethics. Um. I'm probably sitting on the cynical end of the sofa here, so <laughs> I'm going to say hit him in the wallet. It's until, you know, people will pay more attention when their shareholders are yelling at them or their shareholders are making a demand than if someone is standing outside their office with a sign. Mm -hmm. So until it becomes a point where either you will be punished by your customers or you will be punished by kind of, you know, your competition with your peers if you do not comply with these standards. I think it's going to be hard to see serious change no matter what happens on the regulatory side or how high a standard we hold ourselves to as individual data scientists. Not going to be too invisible hand about that, but yeah, <laughs> if you can make data ethics pay, you've got a nice self-reinforcing system. I love it. I love the spectrum of this couch. Uh, <laughs> so I want to uh, take some audience questions, but let's say a couple minutes if you have some last thoughts, things that we didn't get to or just you know a summary of what's been said. Do each of you want to share some last thoughts, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. Um, I don't really have last thoughts. I'm looking forward to the audience questions. Okay. I think this has been interesting. Um, it's nice to not be the cynic on the panel. Jenna, are you getting anything you want to share? I was just going to say how fun this has been. I spend yeah. most of my time talking to either investors or quants, so it's really cool <laughs> to see these different perspectives and yeah. see how these problems are being thought about in so many different fields. My last thought is people should check out the Bright Hive uh, data, I'm sorry, CPED, C C yeah. Community Driven Ethical Data Practices. So uh, do, just go datapractices.org. <laughs> okay, um, are there mic runners in the audience? Uh, do people have any questions? Thank you. Um, so I think I may actually be leaning more towards the cynic side on this too. <laughs> Um, I'm thinking about greenwashing and this idea of making data ethics cool. Um, for those who don't know, greenwashing is this practice where environmentalism has become cool, so companies will produce marketing materials that presents their, yes. their activities as being environmentally <laughs> friendly without actually being more environmentally friendly than yeah. competitors. So my question is, how do we avoid that happening with data ethics? Uh, so I... <laughs> I've been hoping to name drop this. There was a paper published recently by a colleague of mine in one of the financial journals that actually looked at the number of social responsibility policies released by given companies. And the correlation was maybe the opposite of what you would think. It was that the more of these you put out and the more statements you make about how good we are, the more likely you were to have had major scandals and to have them in the future. That's right. So some of this is being equally savvy as consumers of data or products that, you know, being able to call people out on that greenwashing or see, wow, if they're talking about it that much, you know, what's the oil spill behind the curtain? Mm -hmm. <laughs> some of that is also releasing tools so that other people who, you know, are mom and dad who are just starting to think about, hey, all this data I've handed over to all these different companies in my life, mm -hmm. that they're able to hold people to account in the same way. Yeah, I would, I'll, I'll answer in two ways. I'm, I'm, I think I'm gonna do like a Marjeet answer. Um, <laughs> and I'll say that the people with the money have the ability to drive change in this space. And I don't think they're capitalizing on it. Um, shareholders, nonprofits that are funding, there's a contract involved in that. And there's nothing that says that those contracts can't put requirements for data ethics in there. We're starting to see it in the nonprofit space with impact investors. They're actually starting to say, I'm giving you this money and you need to be able to show these measurable outcomes related to the data and that you're, and that you're, you're protecting the data in these ways and doing these things. So I think 
that's the way to, to start to prevent some of that greenwashing, is the people that are actually doing the auditing of these companies. Um, in the B Corp space, there's um, B Corp benefit corporations. Um, there's that lab that actually does the regular audits to say, are you a legit B Corp or not? Um, I think you're gonna start to see some more of that where companies will get their stamp that says, yes, you are actually an ethical company. Um, whether that stamp is going to mean anything will be interesting to see. But it would mean more than just marketing material. But it'll mean more than just or marketing material. Or it would mean a bottle of household cleanser. Right? Yeah. Um, I should have made my final thought. Um, there's a whole conversation around the relationship between people and their data. And how do we improve um, the, how do we, and maybe it's just a conversation with me and my friends. Um, how do we, how do we, um, em, how do we better empower people with their data? So informed consent right now sucks. Privacy policies are stupid. Um, how do we do it so that people actually feel like they have more control over what their, over how their data is used and who has access to it? I think this is a whole space that technology could and should be exploring that will empower and encourage other companies to do, be more ethical in their practices when we start to see more tools developed that allow for that. And help avoid the greenwashing, because if, you yeah. can, if the consumer can actually interact with the data and understand it, mm -hmm. then the marketing things don't matter as much. Right. Does that help? Theoretically. It does. My, my face about that was They're not. They're not. I'm thinking about click button, push button stuff. I mean, it's really a simple, sorry. It's, it's really, really, I just wanted to have one, I'm so sorry now. Go ahead. We, right. we have great, I have thoughts. this um, conference <laughs> has been scheduled really well for time for networking and lunch and things like that. So let's see if there's maybe one more question. We just have a few minutes left. I'm just curious, we've been talking about like the eventual evolution of this like monitoring and regulating ethics and stuff. And since like you have come from an academic background and Granted, peer review has its limitations and stuff, but how much do you, all of you think that like something like that could eventually be what we evolve to? We talked also, uh, Jacob before was saying like, you know, re reproducibility and how good your model is and, and whether it's sound and all of that sort of stuff. Like, do we move toward something that's more like rule-based or do we move some toward something that's more like peer review every single time something comes up, there's like people who get the opportunity to be an unbiased outside perspective I'll say it's hard to get that in the private sector because there are always going to be IP concerns. The group I work at within BlackRock, because it came out of kind of an academic background, has a very strong internal peer review. So to the, you know, about 100 people in this giant company who understand what I do and can see all my data and aren't Chinese walled off, those people can review it, but those people also, you know, have the same incentives that I do, so it's hard to be truly unbiased in that sense. I do think, though, that either educate, if there are going to be compliance departments for tech, those departments have to be as educated about data as the people they're trying to regulate, or you get the same situation where, you know, basically all the people who had certain areas of economics went to work for the high frequency trading firms, and none of them were at the regulators. So it took a long time for the regulation to catch up. What do you think? I feel like, uh... Yeah, I mean, when you have proprietary information, I think it's hard. Like, that's a scenario that's just hard. But we do know that there's, there's platforms like GitHub or, um, you know, uh, other uh, analysis platforms for code where people are starting to make that stuff available. And there's the opportunity, I don't know if it's necessarily used, but there's the opportunity to comment and there's communities that are commenting. So that, you know, that could be a, a way that, uh, there's more transparency. It might not be a pure. It might not be a, a, a publication context like we have in academia, but but a peer review in some of these uh, platforms that are used for sharing code. You know that that might be a formula for what you're describing. Natalie, do you have any thoughts on that? Of course I do. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I I agree with Margit and um, Chad that I think peer review will be hard. Um, I also think that peer reviews, IRBs, these types of things, they're looking for different things than operational data use. I think that academic use of data is a very different 
use and, and analysis and um, evaluation than operational data use. Uh, so I don't know what that would look like in the operational space. Uh, I, I think just something as simple as agreeing to some standards would be nice Is in our that... community. Um, like if we just had some standards that we could all agree to that create frameworks for the way that we develop data, then that's, that's bumping up our data quality game a tenfold. Lot. A lot. Well, I don't want to keep people from lunch. Um, you'll all be around the rest of the day. And so please join me in thanking the panelists. <laughs>